Psychotherapy Stripped Bare, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Crystal Acosta. Joining me today are the authors of a new psychological case study book, Bear, Psychotherapy Stripped. Bear gives a first-hand look at a psychologist and her internal thoughts and reasoning as she sits down with her patients and helps them work through their treatments. No two patient stories are the same, but somehow she finds a way to connect one to another. The book breaks down the wall between patient and doctor because the authors include so much of the protagonist's internal struggles and how they are reflected in her own patient's therapy. Whether it's love, fear, rejection, abandonment, or death, readers live through the traumas of the patients as if they were the psychologists. Joining me now are the authors themselves, Dr. Jacqueline Simon Gunn and Carlo DiCarlo. Welcome, Jackie and Carlo. Hi, Hi. thank you for having us. Thank you. So first off, uh, Jackie, what is psychotherapy? Is it, is it a type of science? Um, I consider psychotherapy an art. Um, psychology is a social science, and the um, psychotherapy is an application of psychological theories to helping people. So it's an understanding of human behavior, but because you can't measure it in the same way, and it, there's so much gray area and you need to be flexible and creative, I consider it more of an art. There are people that would disagree with me, um, but I, I would say it's more of a creative process. And Carlo, from a writer's pr perspective, what would you say psychotherapy is to you? I, I agree with Jackie. It's, um, it is a very creative process. Uh, I, I, having been in therapy, um, you can't really measure what um, what's going on between a patient and the doctor, and you um, it, you it is the doctor has to have some kind of flexibility, some kind of uh, uh, creative um, approach to what they're doing. Uh, otherwise, it's very cut and dry, and the patient almost seems. Um, uh, so like an inanimate object. This book is based on, Jackie, your patience. Mm -hmm. How did you two come together to create, cr create it together? How do you fit into it? Um, Want to take? Um, we've been friends for over 20 years. And so we had talked about writing a book together years ago and a few times had outlines. And then I had self-published another book in 2010, which Carlo had offered to edit, but the book had already been edited. So then when I started writing this book, he offered to edit the book. And with his experience as a writer and just having someone to brainstorm ideas with, once he started editing so when i wrote the book each case was separate so it read like an individual story almost like a book of short stories and when carlos started going over what i had given him he thought it could read like a novel so it would be in the genre of non-fiction novel which sounded really exciting to me and so he then became more involved in rewriting over my rights to kind of you know how it flows like a story. It flows like a novel. It has a plot and a climax and a resolution. That's where Carlo came in. Um, because although I've been writing forever, I have uh, um, no experience as a creative writer, but I happen to really enjoy writing narratives. And so he um, helped me. Yeah, I think with that. The f after, when you first asked me to edit, uh, she had given me the first half of a uh, case study, the, the main one test that follows through the whole book. And um, I, gave, I did some uh, just minor copy editing and some uh, editorial notes, and I did some, uh, some rewriting. 
and um, after that, I gave, and I gave her some ideas about where to go with it, and um, that's when I think you decided that you'd rather me actually write it with you than just edit. And, um, and then that's when we sat down and started talking about what kind of patience to, 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 um, yeah, to include and, uh, and what we could do with the book. She really, I think you wanted it to really be something more than her first book. I wanted it to be more riveting um, because that's what it, I wanted the reader to have the experience, which I think in The Therapist Chair, which is the first book, the, the, the accounts are vivid, but because they're written, they're shorter, they're less involved. And I'm re revealing less of, I reveal a lot about my thoughts and feelings, but I don't really go into anything in my own life and how it applied in the back and forth. That I wanted to give readers that experience, both for people in the field and then for people outside of the field. I thought it could hopefully be inspirational in providing, like we had discussed before, some truth about living that I think we as people as psychotherapists are privy to the, that inside look into people's motivations and drives and what really goes on in people's minds that that's not discussed it's just not yeah. proper etiquette to discuss that i wanted people to have the to know what that was like and that hopefully it would help them on some level just by identifying with that process well i know me personally when i read the book i would he see i guess read your, your therapy session with the patient and you you write about what goes on in your mind as you're listening to the patient and you come to conclusions about what's wrong with them or what, what they're going through, but they haven't seen that yet they, on their own. And you That's go through this struggle of you want to, it seems like you want to say it, but you have to hold back. Mm -hmm. how, how do you hold back from, from not, tell, like not telling them what they need to see and having them see it themselves? Well, I think doing that is a huge beginner's error because what happens, I mean, I guess the short answer to your question is just training um, because one of the first things you learn when you're training to be a psychotherapist is that timing is everything. The timing of what you say, especially an in interpretation, which is something that I'm thinking in my mind that I'm extrapolating from what I'm hearing and what I'm observing in someone's behavior and comportment. If I say it before they're ready to hear it, then it's not going to either make any sense. It could force people to leave treatment even. It could be too threatening. So the timing of that is vital. And that's one of the first lessons I learned in my training. Holding back on it sometimes is really hard because it's so exciting to figure all that out and piece it together and realize if, if the patient came to that conclusion, they might be relieved of their suffering. So you know, the mistake you like one might make with, not that I analyze my friends, but if I saw that in a friend and I might say it and then they brush me off like, Jackie, that's, you know, not what happened. I can do that. But in the therapy room, I, I, I have to really think about where the person's at and how they might respond to the interpretation at the, that time. There's actually a case that is briefly she mentioned, leaves, Mary. Yeah where she leaves therapy prematurely because she thinks that Jackie's already jumping to the conclusion that Jackie hasn't even mentioned yet. Although that, uh, it's complicated because in my right. mind I was, but I, you know, people pick up, there's an intuition that mm -hmm. goes back and forth and depending on the intuitive capacity of the particular patient, I, I can remember very early in my training having a patient that was on the verge of tears multiple times about a death and I was young and very inexperienced and I did not want her to cry. Now, I never announced that in the room. I never said, please don't cry. But I think it was so profound for me, like the anxiety that she was gonna cry over this lesson that I might cry with her, I might just lose it. That my body language, there's, there's this like reciprocity that goes back and forth, this unspoken dynamic, and she never cried. And I'd go to my supervisor, she needs to cry. I don't know why she's not crying. And then being an astute supervisor, he had said, well, what's going on for you? And I said, well, I don't want her to cry. I'm scared. And breaking that down for me with my supervisor and then going back into the room more open, eventually she did cry. It's complicated. 
And I, I just want to go back, because you had mentioned before uh, a character, I, well, I can't really say character, a patient in the book. And it, it goes into what we're talking about now. You mentioned Tess. Tess. There was, throughout the book, she, she, you open the book with Tess, you end the book with Tess, she pops in throughout the whole entire book. And that, that internal struggle, there's certain times that she says things and you want to jump out and tell her something or she makes you feel the way, but you hold back because you know she's not ready to hear it or she, she's not, I don't want to say strong enough to hear it, but she's not at that point yet. Can you describe more Tess and her, her backstory? I feel like it might be two questions. I just want to be clear. You're asking about how I held back in when I relate to her? Do you want to hear more? Tell, talk to me more about who Tess is and then how you were able to hold back until she was ready to hear some of the things she needed to hear. I mean, she, I, you know, I, I really see Tess as someone who has, although she at the time of the book is 61 years old, I don't think that her issues are that different from a lot of people in general, um, she's aging. She's, I mean, I think it's twofold. I think she grew up in a house. I, I think she was incredibly beautiful, still beautiful, but in, in youth, you know, uh, such attention to her looks that that became her whole identity. And although she has superior talents in so many other areas, that, not, that was never acknowledged or fostered. And so she had to work so hard to maintain that appearance. And when that was taken away, um, by her surgery, she didn't, she lost her, she, it was such a loss that her identity um, vanished in that sense and she was, and she struggles to get it back and she doesn't know how. Um, on a larger sense, it's a societal issue, which I, I hope comes across in the book because it's something I feel I've been affected by and something I've talked about in my own therapy. Um, clearly something I'm pissed about because I go into that in the book and I think the larger sense of that is Tess is in a world where um, youth is seen as an advantage and and people are doing outrageous things to stay looking young even if they, they're not being young, to look young and that's that's her story and that's where the conflict between her and I come in. There's so much similarity in in many ways, you know, both being petite, um, we're both Jewish, and even though we dress very differently, there's some, like I wear big rings, she wears big rings, there's some similarity that I think really provoked her and she really didn't want me to suffer the same as she. If somehow she could help me not suffer as her, then she would relieve her own suffering, although I, was, I don't suffer the way she does. I mean, in some ways, Yes, because I am an aging woman as well, but I am grateful that I can recognize that I have other things to offer besides my appearance. I wanted to, I'm trying to give that to her, and so we're going back and forth. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, I mean, and that definitely comes across in the book. You can see, because she's, I would say, probably the character or the patient that's mentioned the most, or, and that you, you talk about other patients, and then somehow it always just comes back to Tess or something that Tess ties into it in a way or it makes you feel a way, something with another patient sparks something that Tess might have said. Um, but also there's, there's, a, there's an array of other patients and I noticed that most of your patients, they the stories take place either around the same time or at the, at the same location, but there's one patient that pops in here and there that was at a whole other time in your life and his name was Ralph. And he was a, a, a young kid, I believe, who mm -hmm. just grew up, I guess, on the wrong side of the tracks, was abandoned by his parents. Can you talk more about him and his story? I hope I could do that without crying. I don't know why I'm reading Ralph's it's story emotional. still. It's very, I, I really, um, well, I was a much less experienced therapist. I was still in training for my doctorate, so I was close to the end of my doctorate, but not completed, and so obviously, I mean, what, 14 years younger, 13 years younger than I am now, so that's 13 less years experience. Um, he was in a locked facility. Um, he had killed people. But yet there was something, 
very vulnerable about him. Now, before I worked at juvenile detention, I had worked in some forensic settings, so I wasn't unfamiliar with what it's like to work with a court-stipulated patient, which I think helped me understand how different he was than a patient that comes in on their own volition. Um, one of the things that I think for anyone who's trying to understand and empathize with someone from an inner city is that it's an entirely different culture. And so, whereas there was resistance with Ralph, like he, he had trouble telling me his innermost feelings, I'd be trying to pull that out in, in my private practice. I'd be trying to like figure out how to get someone to really experience the depth of their feelings and be able to share them with me. And, but with Ralph, I knew that that's not safe because if Ralph does that and he goes back on the street, he'll be killed. So part of that is a cultural sensitivity to inner city living and what it was really like for him. And then there's the, all the complexity of him just being this amazing kid born into horrible circumstances. His awareness of it, because he's like so intelligent, um, and his journal telling that story of the crying boy feeling abandoned and wanting his family juxtaposed to the, you know, kind of delinquent gang member exterior. It is very, very intense. And it, he brought that out in all the mental health professionals that came in contact with him. He's really exceptional. And I don't know, for some people reading the book, I don't know, I wonder what their feelings will be for me to be talking about how he told me of some of the murders he committed. Um, and to still really empathize with him. But yeah, because he had pretty, some pretty heavy stuff happen to him, or, and he witnessed a lot of heavy things going on. And I, I felt reading the book, all you showed was sympathy for him. And you're always there for him. Even when you couldn't be there, you wanted to be there. And you, you state that in the book. But Carlo, you know, all these patients, they're Jackie's patients, they're her stories that she shared with you. When you read the original manuscript from story to story, what was your thought process? Because you weren't there for these and now you're reading all these stories. Um, well, I could definitely relate to the stories. Um, I, I, saw my, I saw myself in a lot of what each of the patients were going through. And um, it was when I was doing rewrites, what I really did was uh, expand the story, really um, go into the details and the depth of what was going on, and I would help bring out more of what had transpired in session. Um, but it, I, I found it as much a cathartic process as it probably was for the patients. Um, I remember getting emotional when I was writing things about Tess and about um, the Tony and Raul story, um, even the Sam story. I, I saw myself in a lot of that, and it was, um, and it was it's very moving. Um, sometimes funny and sometimes really touching and um, I would get choked up sometimes. <laughs> it, was, it was an incredible experience to, to work on it with her. And um, it was... And you just said, you mentioned some other patients. Uh, Sam. Sam was another one that stood out for me because I felt Sam's character reflected a lot of you. Mm -hmm. Because you, you are a runner. And Sam was a runner hoping to end up to the Olympics and she had to come for therapy because she was going through um, an eating disorder and she wasn't meeting, I guess, her weight limit for to, to continue training. And her story is a little different than your other patients because she saw she went to therapy for a shorter period of time. You do long like long term therapy mm -hmm. and she only had about a few months window before she had to go to the Olympics. Can you explain more about that whole session and how that differed from every, every other th patient you've seen? Well, in a short-term therapy, you have, to, you have to find out one problem. In a long-term therapy, you're trying to look at the whole person, everything in there. I mean, people usually come in with one problem, even if it's not the thing like you learned in the book. They may come in with one thing and it's really something else that's brought them in, but they're not even aware of it. But in a short-term therapy, you, you don't have time for that. It's let's focus on one thing. And in Sam's case, it was what's going on that's causing her not to meet these really exceptional goals and how can I help her? And I guess 
very early on, I, I start to realize that's not really the question. The question is, what does Sam want? Which in some ways, and of course, since I'm the therapist, there are going to be similar themes because you can't totally ever separate who you are as a person and what you've learned in your own therapy and life experience from how you see helping people. But thematically, the question for Sam is the same question I have for myself, which is the same question for most of the patients, maybe Ralph being an exception, but which is who, who are you apart from what other people's expectations are of you and what do you want for yourself? What's going to give your life meaning, not make everyone around you happy, which ultimately is the question for Sam and, and there is a resolution and it's short, which makes that story very satisfying because it, it's, there is a question, the question's answered and there's a, a resolution, right. so. Uh, I, I think that the thing that really worked for Sam, also uh, being a short term, was that she was open to mm -hmm. what needed to be done. She was prepared to, uh, to face what, she, what her problems were and to, to fix them. Uh, and That's it, true. Yeah. And it was a. And it, it was the the fact that it was a, a quick case, really juxtaposed what was going on with Tony too. Someone who was in total denial of what was go, of what his problems were in his life and how to solve them. Uh, while he put a veil across that, uh, Sam almost immediately was willing to lift that veil and really work on what was what what the issues were. I think a simultaneous issue that comes up in the case of Sam, which again, I don't know, you know, I think everyone's interpretation will be, the book will be a little different, is sort of just the different paths that life can take and how we make a decision and we don't realize how large that, how largely that decision will impact future decisions that become available to us. So as I'm watching Sam, you know, live out this dream that might have been mine, there's, a, there's cause for reflection there um, that I, I believe that most people have, you know, we all have crossroads what to do and trying to figure out what to do and what are the implications later on. And it's crazy because you said first that you originally wrote it story by story, uh, patient yeah. by patient, and then you came in and you combine, you, you put it in this world that the patient's stories intertwine with each other, but they're not the same. No two stories the same. How did you get to that point and find the connection that you could link each little piece by piece? Um, it was certainly a puzzle to, to put together, uh, but it was, it was kind of exciting. Um, I, I, really, I really looked for what the connecting factors were, um, the, what the timelines were, um, for the most part, the, I think the timelines stayed pretty much what they were. Um, I mean, a, as you know, with case studies, you know, details are changed. Um, some facts are, are changed to, um, you know, to hide the patient's uh, identity. identity. Yeah. Um, but I really worked to find what the, what the similarities were. Um, or sometimes the juxtapositions, uh, like I mentioned about Sam and Tony, um, I, 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 we discussed in the book um, that was they they made good links, uh, good bridges between the cases. That um, uh, while Sam was having success, uh, it was easy to then discuss where Tony was lacking or where Tess was lacking. Um, and I would, f I would find those kinds of similarities or, or uh, contrasts to, to bridge the stories. I think a few times where there wasn't a bridge, he then um, called me and, a and asked for specific. I mean, in fact, Ralph wasn't even in the book to begin with. No, there, it wasn't. And, but I was uh, looking for something else to really and he's, bridge. And we had been roommates when I was in graduate school in Miami, so he knew that I worked in juvenile detention. And he said, do you have the story from that time? I actually think I remembered um, you might have. A, a couple, yeah. I mean, you would never really go into details, but sometimes. But I remember, remember you talking about Ralph. Um, you never mentioned his name, but there, there was this one patient who was really, uh, who everyone on the staff really took a liking to, and 
you actually said to me, what if we took him in as a foster child? I'm like, I don't know about that. I don't know if we can deal with that. Um, not for any reason except that we were both in kind of a transitional Yeah, I was, in, I was a grad student. Right. I mean, it just, I mean, it couldn't happen. No. You keep mentioning um, the patient, Tony. The next step from, from after you guys release this book, I know you're working on a screenplay? I'm working on a screenplay. Um, I've been writing screenplays for a number of years and uh, trying to make some headway in that field. And um, I, I, I saw that um, Tony's, Tony's story really lends itself to, uh, to screenplay, to um, its very visual medium. So, um, yeah, so I started, I've gotten the first draft finished on it and uh, going back and doing rewrites. Um, and then hopefully we'll Can you get somewhere with give it. us a brief, I guess, description without giving too much away about Tori's, uh, Tony's storyline? Um, well, Tony has, um, has relationship issues. He, um, he's living a, a dual life. Uh, he really wants to, he says he wants to settle down. He wants to satisfy his family's expectations, but he's really got other expectations for himself that he wants to do, but he, he, holds back. he really holds back and he, e even to himself. Um, and that definitely so, comes across in the book. And I guess the, the readers are really gonna enjoy reading that story and other stories, but unfortunately we ran out of time. But if you'd like more information about Bear Psychotherapy Strip, visit Dr. Jacqueline Simon Gunn's website, Dr. drjacquelinegunn.com. I want to thank you guys for coming on the show. For more information about Carpe Diem, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpediem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Crystal Acosta. Thanks for watching.